So, um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Shuris uh, Manswami uh, from the Indian Institute of Public Health, who's a real leader in the area of uh, drones for medical deliveries um, and uh, supporting communities with this uh, fantastic innovation. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If I can find my cursor, which is good, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to ask Shiresh if he could share his screen, give himself a little introduction, and begin his presentation. Hmm. It's always the way, it takes a bit of time. Okay. Uh, is my screen visible? We can see it, but it, but it's a it's a very um, uh, low aspect ratio. I don't know what's happened there. We can see a long, thin version of your screen. Um, uh, I have a last screen connected to this one. So oh, that's good. No, that that looks good. Okay, great. Okay, then uh, is it okay to start? Please do. Please do. OK, great. Well, uh, thanks, Paul, for the introduction. And uh, I think uh, I'm the only speaker today, so I'm going to use my monopoly position to maybe put some people to sleep. But I think uh, I, I hope that doesn't happen. I also asked uh, some of my students to join the presentation. So I think I'll probably start off there. Uh, we call our uh, the drone project or rather our, uh, it's, it's more of a drone direction as a sky bridge. And uh, what we try to do are, uh, my, my role actually overlaps in a few places. On one side, uh, I work for Public Health Foundation of India, which is the largest public health organization in India. And uh, on the other side, I also run a lab, which uh, focuses on digital health and on mobility solutions for primary health care. So there, there are two things that I actually do. So if you want me to list the things uh, here, uh, one is my lab builds a drone uh, at the moment with off the shelf components. The second is uh, we are trying to customize the drone to carry medical payloads, uh, which require a lot of specializations. And the third as part of uh, the Public Health Foundation of India, and again, similar to what uh, the previous uh, person who was doing uh, this analysis, uh, we are also trying to build the ecosystem in India and uh, trying to bring the academia on board and also the industry. And we have fairly created a good network, uh, which I'll have to introduce you all to join at some point in time. So our uh, uh, aim is broadly to start uh, regular medical logistic services in all the 28 states plus four union territories and hopefully reach out to more than a billion people. I mean, uh, uh, as, we, as we always say, I mean, if there are a billion people, then we'll have to reach all of them. And that's also one of the uh, agenda of the politicians who keep on uh, talking about universal health care, but uh, actually practicing universal health care in a country that's as large as India, with all its uh, diversities and challenges, especially on the ecological side, becomes a huge uh, issue in itself. So that's broadly the areas that I actually work on. Now, we have created a drone. Again, uh, uh, this is fairly a unique looking drone. Uh, it has uh, fairly a large payload component compared to the current uh, medical drones that are available on the market. It can carry actually 16 kgs which we really want to double or even make it uh, four times bigger. And I'll give you the reasons for that. Uh, the second is uh, our drone actually carries multiple payloads and uh, has multiple temperature control. And the reason is uh, medical payload actually has to be uh, what you call, uh, I mean, uh, carried uh, in different uh, temperatures. So we have actually created different uh, boxes or rather same boxes that can maintain different uh, temperatures. And on the back end side, we are actually creating a automated intelligent architecture so that uh, 
the drones can actually fly where it is required when it is required but also carry the different types of payload so a lot of these things on the back end could potentially be automated which we are doing and as i mentioned the drone looks a little bit different compared to uh, what is already there and it makes it a bit of original design and technology we have applied for several patents but that's more mostly on the design side but as I mentioned, we are also creating a national discussion platform with the World Economic Forum, uh, which is again a global organization, uh, trying to bring together all the national players on the industry side and also on the academic side. Uh, along with uh, Niti Aayog, which is the government-sponsored uh, Apex think tank, which broadly sets the direction for a policy to actually follow. So it's fairly a very well-attended uh, discussion group. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the reason why my lab is actually working towards uh, drones is because uh, one, it works on primary healthcare and also how to digitize primary healthcare. But as I mentioned, the only way we think at least we can reach a country as large as India is by actually traveling or using drones. And because uh, there are still large parts of the country which are not at all accessible or perhaps like let's say, take a day or even two days uh, to reach by foot and uh, there is simply no motorable roads to uh, uh, again a significant number of uh, places in the country and this becomes a huge challenge if you'd want to you know kind of uh, provide a service like a covid vaccine which is uh, being rolled out at the moment where uh, uh, it's an extremely challenging situation where you have these uh, vaccines which need to be controlled temperature wise and also are extremely fragile and on the other side you don't have a means of access to this population but you still have to vaccinate them in a very short time and you need to vaccinate the entire population previously vaccination was uh, given only to a very small segment of the population but now we are looking at a hundred times bigger uh, uh, service load and that becomes challenging with the very poor uh, logistics uh, backend uh, which exists in certain parts of the country. A large part of the country is still fairly good uh, and that itself provides another set of problems which means traffic jams. So the urban side of it although has good connectivity and good roads again has uh, you know uh, what you call several traffic bottlenecks so broadly it seems that uh, drones could potentially serve the urban and also the rural population. But as I mentioned, if you'd want to reach out to 100% uh, or rather 100% of the areas in the country, we think drones are the only way to go. And also by bringing in a lot of uh, automation, we think this actually becomes a lot more simpler service. I have some maps on the right side. I'll kind of uh, explain this a little bit later. So this is the drone that we have actually developed. So it looks, uh, I think it looks like the uh, Star Wars uh, Stormtroopers, but that's just my imagination. Maybe others could imagine it in a different way. So what I will do is uh, I'll, I'll just pause the presentation and I'll, I'll play a video, uh, which broadly shows how we actually assembled the drone from ground up with parts, which I mentioned. Uh, this is also a skill that we have actually developed because, uh, you know, uh, Building a drone, you need to know all the parts and then get from scratch so that you'll be able to modify based on your requirements. And this is an ongoing iterative process. The second is I'll also show some uh, fairly uh, small test flights, not very long range ones, because again, that's uh, a process that is currently going on and we still haven't actually had the videos to show it to you. But uh, I think that will give you a good understanding of the drones and the kind of payload that actually goes in. Uh, I'll, I'll just pause and uh, shift to a different screen. I hope my screen is visible.
Yep, we can see it nice and clearly. Okay, sure good. Is. Yep. Okay. I'll just be quiet for a few minutes. I wish my students moved so quickly. That looks fantastic. Oh, that's a time lapse video. I, I didn't convert my students into robots yet. This almost like a whole day's work compressed into a few seconds, I guess. So as you see here, uh, the drone can carry four boxes and each one can actually carry payload uh, at a different temperature. Well, we were having a bit of a drizzle uh, that day, I guess, so the drone still worked. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll stop the video, I guess. Uh, it's just flights uh, in different places, I guess, from now on. And I'll uh, go back to the presentation. Uh, 
Uh, can you see the screen again? Um, yes, we can. Um, it's just a little bit small. Uh, if, uh, perfect. Okay. okay. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, so that's the drone that we have actually built. And as you see, it's fairly heavier payload and uh, we are hoping to uh, fly it for at least 20 kilometers, but uh, we would want to uh, improve the power plant so that it actually flies all the way up to 40 or 50 uh, kilometers and hopefully autonomously as we go forward. Currently, it's all very controlled the trials that we are actually running. And the reason is, uh, as I mentioned, India has uh, several places which are very remote. And what you see here is images that were actually shared by the healthcare workers in the last two, three months. It's not very long ago. So it's pretty much the current situation. And uh, this is where we want to uh, roll out our drones and provide a lot of services using drones as the logistics uh, backend or logistics uh, platform, which can provide a lot of services on the front end. So broadly, we are looking at uh, using drones for three services. One is connecting the healthcare facilities. This slightly differs from the applications uh, where drones for medicine are being used in other countries, which is primarily the last mile solutions. But here we want to uh, convert it into a reliable supply chain link for the existing healthcare facilities, which unfortunately, as you see from the images, do not have a good road link. And when it rains, it becomes impossible to even reach out to them. <coughs> the second is uh, to use for search and rescue, which I guess uh, uh, is more dependent on the cameras on board. And the third is to provide support logistics. And we are hoping that uh, in the near future, e-commerce and uh, deliveries uh, by the e-commerce platforms would actually pick up very fast and we would want our drones to be part of the support logistics facility. So broadly, these are the three areas that we are actually looking at. And uh, what you actually see here is India has a fairly uh, good on paper system for providing primary health care. In fact, uh, there are almost 30,000 primary health care facilities that are government owned and managed. But the challenge here is reaching out to at least 10 to 15 percent of these facilities are almost impossible or it is very difficult. And 10 to 15 percent is actually a pretty large number. You are talking about at least three to five thousand of these primary healthcare facilities that are almost very difficult or near impossible to reach. And each of these primary healthcare facility serves around 20,000 to 50,000 people. So these are huge numbers. And this is where we want to use our drones to supply everything that a primary healthcare center actually requires. And hopefully, maybe at the next step, to provide the medical products that are required at sub center. So you have the primary healthcare center, and each one is actually connected to at least five to 10 sub centers. And each of the sub center caters to around uh, 3,000 to 5,000 people. So it's a fairly existing, well functioning network. But rather, uh, the functioning part uh, is uh, severely affected by the lack of a, a logistic system that actually uh, is necessary for it to really function well. And this is where the problem is. There are people, and each of these primary healthcare centers is at least uh, you know, ma uh, manned by around 15 to 20 personnel. And uh, there is a very poor back-end logistic system to uh, supply these people with whatever they want. And this is the map that actually uh, shows all the location of the facilities. Again, uh, data from certain states are missing, but uh, broadly, rest of it is actually available. And what we are actually proposing is drone for the middle and the last mile. And this is what I mentioned that in most cases, drones are used as the last mile. But in India, we actually require drones for the middle and the last mile. And uh, we think it actually uh, even has a economic, uh, what you call, uh, rationale to it. Because presently, uh, India has around 30,000 primary healthcare centers, but these are grouped under 600 odd districts. And each one actually functions as an independent unit. And even with all these uh, facilities, you are still not able to reach out to 100% of the population because of the logistics challenges. And what we are actually proposing is, if you are able to you know, reduce the number of these uh, districts or rather the operational units into much simpler and much smaller ones, and if you have a longer range drone that can carry a heavier payload, 
then you don't need to have this fairly large complication of maintaining 600 odd separate individual units, but you can reduce them by at least uh, maybe one in five ratio, and you'll have a much more manageable structure. But that's only part of the story. Now, with the drones, you would be able to reach out to 100% of all the locations that you would want to serve. And that itself is a huge reason to take the direction of drones. And when you see that instead of having 600 odd facilities, you are only looking at uh, a fifth of them, which broadly works out to around uh, maybe something like 100 to 150 facilities. You see that there is even an economic rationale uh, to use drones, even though they are actually a little bit expensive at the moment. But we think that as you go forward, uh, the cost of drones will drastically fall down. And in fact, uh, India has actually one of the cheapest uh, mobile phone service networks in the in probably the whole world, where even downloading a GB of data possibly costs less than uh, you know, 10 pence or perhaps around that, which is not available in most of the uh, you know countries in the world. So as you go forward, you would actually see that the cost of drones would drastically come down, but it also gives you an unique opportunity to reach out to 100% of all the people who would probably be living all over the country or who are living all over the country. So this actually uh, is the proposition that we are actually putting forth to the government that drones are actually economically viable uh, compared to the present thought process where uh, people see it as an expensive last mile and possibly only you know on demand or maybe high value product uh, uh, demand uh, platform. So this is something that uh, we actually uh, uh, thought of or probably realized when we went on a, a field trip to one of the districts, uh, neighboring districts where my lab is. And uh, what we actually did was we mapped all the facilities. We mapped all the facilities, we geotagged all the villages. And what we actually found out was uh, even for a very small district, and this is a district of 1.5 million people. And this is actually one of the smaller districts in India. There are larger districts where each district alone has around uh, 5 million people or perhaps uh, maybe even closer to 10. So what you actually see here is from the center of the district to the remotest uh, primary healthcare center, it is at least 50 kilometers. And as I mentioned, this is one of the smaller districts. So if you are looking at larger ones, if you want to even send a drone from the district warehouse to the farthest PHC and uh, come back, then you are looking at a drone that needs to fly at least you know 100 to 200 kilometers. But if you do that, you'll be able to provide 100% service on demand or perhaps even regular service of whatever medical payload that any of these primary healthcare centers actually requires. And then you'll be able to provide universal healthcare. But when you're talking about medical payloads, there are different types, even your essential medicine list, which uh, is actually uh, proposed by the WHO and more or less followed by almost all countries with a five to 10% variation, has almost 600 odd products to it. And a lot of them require temperature control of different zones. Vaccines are, you know, have to be maintained at two to eight degrees. Most of them, newer vaccines uh, have to be even maintained at uh, sub-zero and minus uh, temperatures. And then you have blood that needs to be maintained at about 15 to 24, which uh, is actually ambient temperature in several countries. But in India, you are looking at an ambient uh, temperature of over 40 or sometimes even 50. So this even uh, requires actually temperature control. So you are looking at different products and some of them may not even require any temperature control. So you are looking at at least a few classes of products, which means if I want to supply medicines or all the requirements for a primary healthcare center, I need to have a modular platform. I also need to fly long distances as in 100, 200 kilometers, and I need to carry multiple payloads. So this is the thought process that we had in 2018 and uh, it was actually covered in one of the leading newspapers in India. I think uh, the Hindu, the British equivalent would possibly be the Guardian newspaper. So this was our thought process in 2018. And uh, even before that, uh, my lab was actually working on the idea of drones. And in 2015, we actually flew the you know drone with a box of medicine strapped onto it. This was a, probably one of the earliest model of DJI drones. But what we also did was we have actually weighed and identified the volume of each and every medicine that is on the essential medical list. So broadly, we have an idea on you know what's the weight of the medicine, what's the size of the medicine. But when we actually went to this district of 1.5 million people, we photographed the all the OP records 
and all the inpatient records of all the patients coming into government facilities. So broadly, we also have an idea on what kind of diseases that they are suffering from, what kind of treatment is actually provided, and also the number of patients coming into these facilities and also the volume of medicines consumed by each and every facility. And obviously, with the GPS tags, you also get the location and the distance from the central warehouse. So with all this information, we broadly uh, propose that uh, you actually need a drone that can carry at least 50 kgs and fly 100 to 200 kilometers because only at that level you would be able to satisfy the requirements of the primary healthcare center. Now, as of now, we don't have a drone that can actually satisfy these requirements, but at least this gives us a direction on which way to go. And that is broadly reflected in the drone that we have actually uh, developed. And uh, that's the rationale for uh, this drone that you actually see here, where you have multiple temperature control boxes and it actually carries a heavier payload. And we want to push it uh, far as far as almost 100 to 200 uh, kilometers. But this is actually uh, satisfying only a limited requirement of us. And we would want to actually increase the payload by at least twice or even quadruple the payload and push the uh, range by at least uh, maybe again another four times. <coughs> As I mentioned, uh, we went even farther and then we thought, okay, from the you know healthcare facilities, why don't we actually go to even the people's homes and see what kind of access that they actually have. And what we actually found out uh, going to almost like 130,000 people and then mapping each and every household, at least in a very small area and 130,000 people is a very small area in India, is that almost only 20 to 30 percent of the people actually have uh, government health care access a lot of them do not have health care access do not have government health care access and a lot of them actually rely on fairly very expensive private health care access so this is what we actually found out that there's a huge need to uh, provide some kind of a uh, logistics backbone to support the existing health care systems and if we do that We'll be able to uh, we'll be able to increase the uh, service levels to almost five times. What the government thinks is, uh, if the primary healthcare system gets better, maybe the increase in service will go up by fifty percent, which broadly is not too much. And what we thought this is the gap that actually exists. So we need to have a longer drone. We need to have a heavier payload drone. But if we do that, we'll be able to serve the time, people five times better, and we'll be able to even achieve universal healthcare. So broadly, that's the objective that's, uh, that we are actually working on. And as I mentioned, my lab is actually trying to work on two directions, which is to provide primary health care and also to provide a comprehensive and real-time service. But uh, just a second. So the, the, the two layers that my lab is actually working on is to create the digital health screening system and also the mobility layer. Now, again, one of the questions that people actually ask is, uh, why are you actually building a relatively higher tech service, a logistics backend with the drones, when there is very limited uh, screening or uh, you know even a service that is actually happening on the digital platform on the ground level? So it's almost like you know uh, we are trying to build a solution where there is no need exists. So we need to actually look at both ways. Where the my lab is actually working on trying to build digital screening systems using fairly very unique uh, unique software where we are trying to screen for all kind of conditions using no language icon based uh, screening software I'll, I'll show you the images and we believe once we roll this out fairly on a larger scale we'll be able to go to each and every household and then screen them at the doorstep but that will actually create a huge database which will understand what kind of needs people have but it will also be passed on to the primary healthcare centers where if you are able to supply with drones, we will be able to improve the uptake of primary healthcare of the people, but we will also be creating an extremely efficient backend supply to address the requirements on the ground. So the focus is on two areas. One is on the digital health layer to screen and also the mobility layer to supply the requirements on the ground. And broadly, this is how the you know uh, the, the conceptual system works. On the left side, you have you see our softwares which does not have any text in it, 
and you are actually screening for the disease conditions. In fact, we are bringing in a lot of AI ML layers where you take an image and instead of asking 10 or 20 questions, you'll be able to pass the information from the images itself. This is ongoing work. So as we roll out more and more on the ground, and collect more and more images, this will actually improve a lot better. But on the right side, what you actually see is our drone. And we have also built a two-wheeler platform that carries exactly the same boxes that the drones actually carry and deliver the medical products to the healthcare facility and hopefully from the healthcare facility to the person's home. And this is an entire ecosystem that we are actually creating. And this is necessary, especially in a country like India, because when you are looking at primary healthcare, a lot of people are actually building innovations. But the challenge is, where do you accommodate the innovation? Uh, uh, UK has a very well-functioning uh, you know, health system, the NHS, where if you have an innovation, you need to find out how do you accommodate in an NHS. But the problem in India is innovations also need an ecosystem to support. And this is where at least we are trying to build a framework where these innovations could actually be accommodated and could potentially be scaled up. So these are some of the images. I prefer my presentation with a lot of images because uh, as people say, an image is a thousand words. So what you have here is 4,000 words of condensed information. So recently we downloaded our software almost to 130 mobile phones and uh, the healthcare workers that we train are actually taking our softwares to screen almost like uh, close to half a million people. And these are the images where the healthcare workers are reaching out to the people's home uh, in a very comprehensive way. Each and every house is actually being screened. And this kind of primary data that is actually being generated is being automatically analyzed. And again, this is work in progress. And this is where we are able to automate a lot of things in the process where the requirements of the people or requirements to treat these disease conditions can be auto-populated. The, ne the necessary medicines, again, can be auto-intended. And this is where we think the drones can actually serve the purpose of automatically identifying the medicines and delivering it to the point of need however remote or however uh, inaccessible these uh, pl places are. So what you also see here is each of the images that our uh, healthcare workers are take, uh, uh, taking are also geotagged and also date and timestamp, which broadly improves the reliability of whatever service that we are actually doing. So this is the image of the box that I've been mentioning. As I said, it actually is accommodated in the drone and also in the two-wheeler uh, platform. And what you see here is broadly several layers of lining. And as you all know, medical payload is not only uh, fragile, but also needs to be temperature controlled. So what we do is we use the same box, we vary the lining. And this blue lining here uh, can actually fit in a chemical called as phase change material. And when you change the chemical, it also changes the freezing point of the chemical. So you can use the same box to carry a variety of payloads. So here you see, Again, a divider that is actually designed and custom designed to carry almost like 36 uh, blood wires. And this is again necessary because when you are uh, transporting uh, these medical products in glass or probably in the, although this is probably clear plastic, uh, again, we need to control the temperature, we need to control the vibrations, we need to control the, uh, uh, I mean, the several parameters here so that uh, the payload can actually reach the loca intended location fairly safely. And these are all things that we are actually building in our lab and we are actually rolling it out to, to test. And hopefully uh, we'll start some uh, you know, joint research, research project with uh, Dr. Paul's team and also identify how the, uh, the effect of temperature and vibration on the medicines and also the blood products. So this is how, uh, as, you, uh, as you saw in the video, the temperature control boxes can actually fit onto the drones. Currently, it's designed to carry four boxes, but as you, uh, uh, we are actually looking at larger drones that can actually fly for longer distances also. So this is more of a cross-platform uh, product where the same boxes has multiple users. And you also see a box that does not have any temperature control that can carry regular medicines also. So that's one part of the work that my lab is actually doing. The other part of it is as part of Public Health Foundation of India, as I mentioned, uh, we are creating this, uh, I mean, uh, discussion platform. So this is the, um, uh, what we call an invite for the industry core group, which was held very recently, maybe just a month before, where we were able to bring in uh, 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 stakeholders from 
uh, India stock companies like Tata's, Adani's, and also Reliance, who are very keen to enter the drone space uh, for a variety of reasons. But healthcare is uh, of prime importance because they are able to reach out to a very large audience, almost the entire set of people. So again, uh, there is uh, several interests here. E-commerce again is being rolled out uh, to a wide variety of population. Drones are actually being used, and uh, healthcare broadly benefits from uh, advan I mean innovations that actually happen in other areas, and that seems to be the case here where drones are seen as a multimodal transport and healthcare seems to greatly benefit uh, by these advances. We have actually published uh, several papers and I'll be happy to share if anybody is interested with the World Economic Forum documenting all the discussion that has actually happened in the, uh, in the group discussions, but also bringing out our thought process in a very documented way. Uh, in fact, like uh, this is also one of the areas where we are trying to convince people that India actually requires drones for both middle mile and also last mile logistics. There are several areas in our country which are hard to reach. But after people started seeing our drones and our images, in fact, we are getting a lot of feedback from the industry groups that they are actually seeing several use cases for the drones that we are actually trying to build. In fact, in the uh, recent past, in the last two, three weeks, People think that our drones can actually be used to transport high value horticulture products, uh, aquaculture products, even food process, and all of them have a little bit in common with the medical payload because they all require some kind of a fragility control and also temperature control also. So people are actually imagining a lot of use cases for the drones that we are building. And I think that is a very extremely successful outcome for the discussion groups that we are actually building. Uh, again, as part of Public Health Foundation of India and with the World Economic Forum, it's also our job to go uh, as much as possible in person because COVID is still there and convince the bureaucrats also that uh, this is a necessary and uh, timely innovation that needs to be rolled out. And again, everybody knows about Indian bureaucracy and how convoluted it is. And uh, we need to meet uh, people in person and then showcase and then explain all those things. And, uh, and they're all very uh, keen to see drones being used as a regular service in, in, in most of the states. Although there are a lot of questions being raised, uh, especially in border areas uh, with regard to narcotics and uh, maybe uh, people using it for other reasons. I think people generally agree that uh, healthcare and long range drones with heavy payload would actually serve a real need on the ground that currently exists. So these are some of the images of the potential new drones that we are building. And uh, as I mentioned, what uh, we are aiming to start regular drone services in almost all the states, and hopefully it will be uh, a regular feature uh, with the medical uh, logistics in the next uh, maybe a few months or perhaps a couple of years very soon. And as I mentioned, I think I'll take this opportunity to invite uh, you also to join the discussions. If you're interested, please send me a mail. I'd be able to send an invite. And uh, actually, Israel is a very active partner in this discussion. So uh, please uh, feel free to send me a mail and uh, join our discussion groups also. Well, uh, thank you. I hope uh, uh, I, I'm still keeping the people awake. Sherish, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much for that. And more than keeping people awake, we had lots of um, people coming into the meeting as you were speaking. So that's that, that's just perfect. Um, First of all, I've, I've got to mention to the, the network that sadly Hubert from um, Safe Cluster is unable to present today and he's facing the problem that we all do is that the weather got in the way of some of his tests. He was doing something for the Olympics and they've had to reorganise for today so he can't be part of this. But this has given an opportunity for Shuris to give us a bit more background and a bit more evidence of his fantastic work. So that was good. Um, but we've got a number of excellent questions, Sherish. So if if that's OK, I, I, I'm going to read them out and then then invite um, the question uh, poser to 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 kind of respond and join in the conversation. So the first one up is from Deirdre and she was wondering, wondering about the social acceptance of the use of drones in India from the general public, uh, as well as central government. And has COVID sort of changed the perception? I think I've summarised that reasonably well. Well, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, uh, yes, in fact, like uh, 
pre covid and post covid are two different uh, timelines i think in our lifetime uh, pre covid in fact like there are a lot of people who are questioning our motives also why do you want to take healthcare home i mean this seems to be very intrusive and uh, why are you taking so many images why do you need drones to be flying around but post covid everybody is thankfully seems to be understanding that uh, this is actually uh, not just an incremental step but this is also a necessary step which saves people a lot of uh, troubles but also helps the you know disease management process also the, you need to reach out to people because in most cases especially in developing countries people come to healthcare facility at a very late stage so the disease is already you know kind of fairly at a very late stage when they come but when we go to the people's home on a regular basis we should be able to catch these diseases a lot early but that also means that you have a huge requirement for medical products because if you want to give them some prophylactic medicines or if you want to do point of care diagnostics there needs to be an extremely efficient back end chain so that is where we think drones can actually serve a purpose so i would say rather thanks to covid that uh, it becomes now a bit of a self explanatory process that drones are actually necessary but on the other side if if you look at in a country like india like any country there are people who agree with what we want to do there are people who disagree and uh, the advantage here is even if you are looking at you now like let's say a very small number which is 20% of people who actually agree but still a huge number in in reality you are talking about 200 million people who still agree with in fact like the number is sufficiently large there are very few people who disagree maybe around 10 15% -10%. so the actual uh, reality is a lot of people do agree of course there are several challenges in the uh, in the way drones have to be actually run and what we are actually proposing is not some kind of a random drone service where you know for every eventuality drone is going to go up and then you know travel in populated services uh, areas so this is where we are actually identifying existing healthcare facilities and uh, existing places from where regular services can be made better and uh, we want to start off with existing uh, facilities in fairly rural and remote areas hard to reach areas let us start there because on one side although we would want to kind of you know make the services a lot more efficient there is lot of things that we also need to learn from the drone based services and we can't actually send the drones into highly populated areas and then learn there so the idea currently is we have facilities that are extremely underserved so let us start there let us run it as a year long project maybe even 3 years if possible let us understand all the possibilities and let us bring in lot of safety features into the drones because there are a lot of unanswered questions here what happens if a drone falls what happens i mean can we even control the fall of the drone can we put in some kind of a redundancy facilities how are we going to even uh, you know fly the drones uh, there are some broad answers which have not been tested on the ground and we need all this evidence so this is the approach that we are actually taking which is let us start identify uh, the hard to reach areas and probably you know identify all the people living around a, a, under the drone uh, routes maybe we'll have to explain to them we'll have to build a drone route which avoids as much of the population as possible run it as much as possible and then again there is temperature issues there is actually altitude issues uh, there are poly uh, so connectivity issues that actually uh, have and then once we roll this out for a year if we have sufficient understanding and if we think this is good then we'll gradually expand the service as we go forward fantastic answer <laughs> really good um i've got an eye on the cuz lots of lovely questions coming in so i'm going to be slightly rude there i mean do, do you have any other comments didri or or is oh, didri's gone no No, I'm here. Just really quickly, um I also was wondering if um the use of drones is being considered um around its ability to help India uh reduce carbon. And so if you're thinking about healthcare logistics, moving things by drones, um another outcome of that is a significant um uh, reduction in 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 carbon emissions and whether that factors into um the shaping of 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 government policy around drones i don't know if you're placed to answer that but and wonderful presentation by the way suresh thank you very much thank you uh, in fact we are pleasantly surprised that uh, when we found out that this is also another thought process that is actually you know coming up in fact like uh, uh, in the next month's uh, cop 21 meeting in glasgow they are even proposing or they will be proposing 
the drones would actually be a sustainable model of uh, reaching out to this hard to reach places because the present way is to you know kind of bulldoze a lot of trees and then build a, a road because on one side these people want some kind of an economic connect but on the other side they don't want these ecologically fragile areas to be you know kind of destroyed for roads and uh, unnecessary connectivity so you just want the right amount of connectivity uh, no connectivity again is a challenge because medical needs are there and you want some access to the mainland and uh, on the reverse side you want to send your produce so that you can be economically sustainable so this is where again uh, the discussion leads to longer range and heavy payload uh, drones which are if you are able to fly and reach out to these places you would actually be providing some kind of a year round sustainable transport but on the other side if you are able to put up a micro grid micro renewable energy grid with some solar power or perhaps wind power you would be able to even power this drone while it is actually coming back so it could actually be a win win situation and this idea is actually uh, being proposed at the cop 21 meeting that would hopefully be happening next month i mean it would be happening but the idea would be hopefully being proposed wonderful thank you um so i mean the the questions are coming thick and fast uh, sherry and 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 i think it's a compliment to to your work and your presentation um i'm I, please have a look at the chat because uh, tom sherrett is has 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 g given an example of a of a successful larger drone that he's been involved with in terms of the development um and i'm i'm going to kind of sort of collect together th almost three questions so there's tom um, talking about larger fixed wing um, drones. Annalise has asked whether um, a team of smaller drones could be used, so uh, drones for particular items almost. And then right at the end here, I think um, Trevor Henry ha has mentioned, have you considered applications of VTOL uh, multi-rotor fixed wing instead of just multi-rotor. So I think those three questions are kind of what's your decision process with the type of drone you're using in terms of how it's propelled and is there any opportunities for the fixed wing or the or the kind of um, fixed wing uh, multi-rotor sort of uh, combination, the VTOL type of aircraft? Uh, okay, uh, well, th thanks a lot for those questions. So uh, broadly, uh, broadly speaking, now, the use case that we are actually considering is, you know, from a district warehouse to an existing primary healthcare center. Now, fixed wings in some cases do require a runway and uh, that becomes a lot more challenging, although they have several advantages and relatively speaking are a little bit less complicated and more reliable. Uh, our idea is basically, you know, you need to uh, land these drones within a within a compound. It's it's not very small, but it's not uh, as big as to accommodate a, a runway. And the reason again is, if you are going to do transportation between one government compound to another government compound, there are lots of less regulations that actually come in play because both are actually government owned, and we are not looking at uh, you know as of now delivering into private air spaces or even like uh, you know uh, what you call uh, owned spaces also. So if we are going to use, uh, I mean, consider this as a use case, VTO also would probably be the best choice. Uh, the second question is, can we use smaller drones? Uh, yes, in fact, we are considering this because that, those are the ones that are currently available off the shelf. In fact, like uh, in the next stage of trials, we'll be using drones that can fly uh, two kgs to five kgs, and we'll actually be using a swarm mode where what we'd actually want to do is uh, tell people that you know deliveries of 10 kgs and 20 kgs is still possible. Initially, we will use smaller drones and then do it. But as we go forward, when people get used to the idea of you know I can get 10 kgs, 20 kgs, I can even get 50 kgs, then it becomes a lot more uh, easier for us to even uh, convince the business guys that we need to actually build the larger drones uh, fairly quickly. And uh, to the other comment, yes, I think I've recently read about this Royal Mail. Uh, uh, drone that can actually carry 100 kgs, and uh, I'd be very happy if uh, you know I can get in touch and uh, you know get some more information. So these are the kind of drones that we are actually looking for. 
Um, well, I'm, I'm sure Tom can can sort of direct message you ab ab about that, and so um, yeah, he's been involved with those with those larger drones, and they seem they seem to have a very good potential. Um, I've got a couple of questions from uh, Bonnie Gray, and I'm going to try and summarise them so we you you can um, uh, answer them. But just to sort of speed things up, I think she's got a question around the sort of government rules um, and the rules changing uh, at the moment and um, you know what's what's the sort of regulatory landscape is it fairly fixed is it changing and then a, 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 a supplementary question about that is um, you know what it, I think you've almost answered this about you know densely populated areas obstacles trees wires and that kind of thing how are you accommodating for those kind of issues so a question around the regulatory space in india and something around the urban kind of obstacles uh, again thank you for the question uh, in fact like uh, i'm living in uh, you know two different situations now in 2015 when our team first flew the drone and uh, it was actually covered in the newspapers i actually you know got a call from the local police head and uh, I was almost like threatened to be arrested. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, thankfully they did not do it because uh, you know, our institution is also mostly government, so you, you can't actually do that also. But I had to actually uh, write a, I wouldn't call it as an apology letter, but a kind of a, you know, a response to a strict warning that uh, if I'm going to do things again, I'll really take all the approvals. And nobody had a clue what approval should I take. So these guys called up and said, you have to get all these approvals and I have to approve. So I asked them, like, what approval? Nobody had a clue. So that was the situation in 2015. And uh, almost immediately after that, there was a complete ban on all kind of drones. Now, from that time, uh, although we continued as academics, so we don't have you know issues with rules and regulations and most of the time. What happens in our lab stays in our lab most of the time. Until <laughs> it is time for us to actually you know release it out to the general public. Uh, but now the situation is that in the last maybe one or two months, we actually have a very open and a friendly regulation where we are actually short of drones that we would want to fly. So suddenly you have the government opening up and say you can fly drones as uh, you know heavy as 500 kgs. And there's actually not even one drone inside where we can even carry 20 or 50 kgs. So from that end of the spectrum to the other end where uh, you actually have a map that you can you know open up and then see what are the red zones, what are the orange zones and what are the green zones and green zones. Uh, broadly with just a few approvals you can actually fly so things have changed a lot so government is very supportive now and uh, in fact like uh, in the last two weeks again the government has actually come out with a productivity linked scheme where if you invest and then if you uh, i think uh, you know uh, make a business of x they will also give you a refund to support the businesses to actually start up so there are a lot of things that are actually happening that are extremely positive from the government side and also, as I mentioned, COVID uh, seems to jumpstart a lot of digital services. So a lot of good things are happening around around the drones here. Now, uh, with regard to the rules and regulations, yes, uh, sometimes the governments are a bit temperamental, although the rules and regulations have opened up uh, this trickle down of people actually understanding how it is being implemented is again a bit of a challenge. So this is where we are trying to use this uh, discussion groups to bring government bureaucrats on board, the industry on board, and uh, you know, kind of have a discussion on how things could actually be implemented. So fairly, it's actually a good process that's uh, it's going on. Uh, did I miss any part of the question? No, I think you comprehensively covered that. That was that was fantastic. And I think you were starting to reveal a little bit of the sort of laboratory magic there. So I was just <laughs> um, I've got an excellent question um, from um, uh, Anne's Marie. Um, what about stability data? Do you have any stability data for the medicines that you've transported? Well, I thought that's something that we are going to work and answer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. But I, I'll give that question to you. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think uh, Anne Marie, we're kind of working together anyway, and, and 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 I think it's it's a space that's growing. Those questions are being asked, and and we and we're doing the experiments. I, I think really so, and like as you were uh, uh, alluding to in the regulatory piece, 
when you start doing it, you know, there's not many checks, but when you put it introducing a very new technology, you start to challenge the business as usual as well. So worrying about the impact of a logistical route on, to, on the stability of a particular medicine, you know, it is controlled with temperature and other things, but, you know, the vibration piece starts to c come in. And then you look back at what's going on at the moment with road transport as well. And some of those experiments will have to actually be rolled out to there. So, so that's, that's, I think, I think that's it. I think there's been a nice comment from, from um, uh, uh, Trevor Henry uh, about about reaching out to you in terms of collaboration with some of the VTOL systems. So um, I, I would I would sort of say, you know, start that interaction going there. Um, and I think um, Tom was asking around the the the, the legislation, um, but also just just a final piece. What about dangerous goods? Is has that been an issue with your experience? Because it, coming from a pharmacy background, there's a there's a different approach to what you think um, a, a medicine is. Whereas if you're um, a large carrier of of medical goods, um, you know sometimes the dangerous goods regulations, say in the UK or Europe, start to kick in. So have you had any 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 kind of thoughts or or, or experience around the application of dangerous goods um, uh, legislation for your missions and planned activities? Uh, uh, thankfully, not yet. Uh, all the question and the focus seems to be on the drones, how long they will fly and how long, you know, uh, what are the places that uh, they will actually reach out and what kind of broad services that could potentially be delivered. And uh, in fact, like there will be more and more of these questions, uh, the so-called micro questions where you need to understand, you know, about the payload and then about the stability of the payload and the factors that actually affect. And unfortunately, the first thing is we need to ask those questions and nobody actually has the answers. Nobody has actually put, you know, a medicine on uh, different kinds of drones uh, and then, you know, flown for, uh, you know, hours together, especially in different countries. So uh, what happens in an in a ecosystem of 20 degrees may not actually apply for an ecosystem of 60 degrees. So these are questions that need to be actually asked, documented, and uh, we need to find answers. But... I think the present thought process, and thankfully, uh, it's still present thought process because there is no adverse events that are actually reported, is that we'll kind of uh, experiment on the service and as we progress, we'll actually find the answers and the service itself can actually continue in a, in a fairly limited way with, uh, uh, with the payload that is not very kind of a, you know fragile payload or perhaps like not very temperature sensitive payload so we are looking at fairly uh, regular payload as uh, as of now uh, it's just that in the present covid scenario covid vaccines also take a precedence but beyond that what we are looking at is fairly regular medicines but even this we have to test quickly and find the answers and uh, as we keep going forward we need to bring in uh, risky payloads and then start simulating them and see how they actually behave and uh, this is where the, the you know kind of two types of work that we do on one side on the lab we try to find these answers but as part of public health foundation of india uh, closely working with the government we also need to kind of uh, you know pass on this information to the government and hope to get them onto the legislation also and come out with some kind of a guideline to see you know what's possible if it is possible what is the you know boundaries that we need to kind of follow here and definitely what is not possible should also be documented and brought onto the legislation so this is an evolving area and uh, i would rather say it's good that there are actually more questions than answers but uh, quickly we'll have to find all those answers also fantastic um I've got a I've got an eye on the clock and 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 I, and I think we've filled the hour superbly well, uh, Sheresh. Um, I've got a nice comment from from well, well everybody really they've really enjoyed your presentation and 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 it's nice to to see the achievements that you've made and and and, and really kind of exploring um, you know the need and closing that that loop in terms of the whole logistical picture and the and and the healthcare picture as well with the with the app and. And, and using conventional um, transportation as well. So fantastic. A very last point, if you have a look in the chat, I think Ewan's given you some uh, uh, some some specific uh, direction to um, some fundamentals around um, uh, dangerous goods as well, as well. He's listed those there, so that could be something to pick up later on. But um, just to say thank you very much, Shresh, for, for, for an excellent talk. Um, I'm, I'm now gonna stop the recording, if I may.
excellent stuff. 